kind of switch gears a little bit um, from talking about agricultural lands and forests to take a trip down to the coast. So um, this is actually one of our national parks. This is Dry Tortugas National Park. So probably one of the, the, the least visited national parks. And that's because it's a three hour boat ride west of Key West, Florida. So it's, it's quite remote, um, but it's a historical site. You can see the lighthouse back here in the background. There's also a large Civil War era fort out there. And when you think about the, the coast and climate change and impacts, I mean, this, these islands out here are not very tall. So maybe the fort, the top of the fort gets to about 15 foot. Um, the lighthouse is probably the largest thing out there. And when you start to think about, you know, coastal climate change impact, you know, these are the types of places we're talking about. You know, if the projections for sea level rise, this national park may not exist at, by the end of this century. So, so if you have a chance, go out there. It's a beautiful location. Um, <laughs> so do it while you can. So it's kind of like how I feel these days. Is I'm trying to hit all the national parks and see them before they change and go away forever. Um, but so a little background on me. Um, so what got me interested in the, the ocean and what's happening in them? And this probably goes back to being a little kid. You never realize these things that you, you share with your children. Um, my dad was in Vietnam and he was in the special operations uh, with the Marines. So we didn't know where he was, but we knew he was over there. And he would send us back boxes of shells. And my dad was a scuba diver. So we'd get these shells and I'd get my shell books out and I would look up their names and try to figure out where, they, where they're from. And that's what really got me started and interested in the ocean is just this one little thing of a box of shells from somewhere on the other side of the world. Um, so my path to academia was a little, it's not straightforward. Um, so being a military child, uh, we moved all over the place. So by the time I graduated from high school, I had been to 13 different schools. For my university experience, I decided to switch things up. All of my degrees are from one university. So, <laughs> so quite a switch. It's so the University of South Florida. So I started off with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And that was kind of at the time in high school, as I was a girl and I was good at math and science and I liked it. So I said, well, the career for you is engineering. And I'm like, okay. So I went, did engineering, did my internships, realized by the time I graduated, engineering was not for me. So, so but at the time there's, computers were starting to become really out there, um, digital technology. So I decided, you know what? I really like theater, so I'm gonna be a theater minor. So as an engineering theater minor, um, <laughs> makes a lot of sense, huh? Um, to the younger 20 year old me, it made a lot of sense. Um, but I did that for a number of years and that led on to me being involved a lot in technology. So went on to work for a Fortune 100 company, a um, large international company as a systems engineer. Um, eventually on to be a manager for the whole Southeast US. Great job, made lots of money, um, traveled all over the place, and it's just the stress. And it was one of those things I, I came to realize this wasn't something I really wanted to do my whole life. And somebody said earlier, you know, pick your first jobs, you know, be strategic with those. And that's good advice. But I'm also going to tell you what you decide right now doesn't mean you're going to do this till you're 65, till you retire. You can change. So I've changed careers so many times. Um, but at some point, I decided, you know, this isn't what I really want to do. I've made my money. I know what that's all about. I'm going to go do what I want to do. So I went back to school, started taking night classes, and started, you know, talking to my professors and said, you know, I was a smart kid in high school. You know, do you think I have what it takes to be a PhD? And I said, well, take the class, write your term paper, we'll talk at the end of the semester. So in the semester comes along, and I get my yellow envelope across the desk to me, and it says, come see me. And I'm just like, oh no, I'm out. Um, but anyways, I went to see the professor, and she said, you definitely have what it takes to be a PhD. This is the best term paper I've ever seen. 
I want you to go down the hall and talk to this other professor. So, so I did that. Um, turns out he offered me a research assistantship to go back to school um, to work on my master's and eventually my PhD. So I kindly told my boss at my where I worked at, the, at Rico and said, you know, I think I'm going to go back to school and get my PhD. And they were very shocked. Um, so it was one of those things. I was very good at what I did. And it's just, I want to do something different with my life. So that's kind of my route to academia. So I love what I do. Um, I enjoy it. And so I can blend all the things that I do together. So I get to go to beautiful places like the Dry Tortugas. Uh, I get to talk to young people like you. And I, I get to enjoy my life. So, so that's kind of my route to academia. So anyways, so, so what is this driving passion that I have? And, you know, it's one of those things that I consider myself a steward of the earth. You know, this is our, this is our home, and we should be concerned about those things. This is actually from the IPCC report back in 2004, but I like this slide because it talks about temperature change. So, and we can go back and look at historical records, and we can crunch all the numbers and compute these averages, and we see that temperatures have been changing. That's the instrumental records. But instrumental records only go back so far. And that's because we just didn't have the thermometers. We didn't have the, the technology going back over 150 years ago to make really good measurements. But in this particular graph, it has this bottom panel. And this goes back in time, all the way back to 1000 AD. So where does that information come from? And it's one of the things we start to think about it. It's like, how do we know that temperatures in the 21st century, or late 20th century, were warmer than the past thousand years. And that's where paleoclimate records come in. Now, because these are not instruments, they're not scientific instruments, they're, they're things that happen in the environment, we have to put error bars on them. So one of the things that IPCC report did was say, okay, we have to assess that error. Just like if, when you're in chemistry lab, you have your precision of your thermometers, and you take that into account, and you figure out your significant digits. We have to do the same thing with paleoclimate records. We have to understand how well they work. What happened in this particular report is they looked at the error bars, and that's the red line there, and at this point, our warming trend got above the error bars, so our uncertainty for all of these paleoclimate records. And at that point, the IPCC came out and said that we're experiencing temperatures warmer than anything we've seen for the past thousand years. So what drives that? And when we start to look at what's driving temperature change, it comes back to CO2. So again, so everybody here has heard of the Keeling curve, so Mauna Loa. So that's CO2 measurements done with instruments. But if you look at this graph, again, it's going back a thousand years. How do we know what CO2 is like in the atmosphere going back a thousand years? And then to tie that to what's happening with temperature change. So all of these are interesting questions. And how do we answer that? And that's the science of paleoclimatology. And I'm a paleoclimatologist, so I study past climate. And unlike climatologists who use scientific instruments, I use things that occur in the environment as a proxy recorder of what's going on. Now, there's some that you may have heard of, like tree rings. So tree rings are great because they have annual bands in them. So if I can count the bands, I can figure out the years. And if I look at the information in each of those bands, that can tell me something about the environment that tree grew in. So let's go on and talk about how we look at a tree ring record. So, so this is from our field trip this past spring, we took a paleoclimatology class over to Mississippi to one of the national forests, and we cored some trees. So this is a core coming out of the slash pine, and you can easily see the band in that core. So by looking at the information in this little tiny core, we can tell the year, and we can look at how much the tree grew from year to year. And that tells us something about the environment that this tree was growing in. So, so here's just a closer look to this particular tree. So you can see these nice bands 
all throughout it. And the bands are closely spaced together. That tells you that growth was suppressed. That could be due to drought. It could be due to storms. It could be due to other disturbances in the environment. Now, when you think about it, you know, it's like, okay, this is a tree. Now, do all trees record the same way? No. It really depends on their environment. So you have to understand the environment that the tree is growing in. So there's lots of nuances to understanding paleoclimate records to pull these climate records out of them. So if we look at where we have tree ring records, so the green um, triangles on this particular diagram shows where we have archives of tree ring records. Now you'll notice lots in North America. So we have this one little patch here. No tree rings. Anybody want to guess what? There's no trees. <laughs> so, so it's right, right, right through Oklahoma and Texas. Um, but for a lot of the U.S., we do have tree, tree ring records up into Canada. Same when you look in Europe. So lots of records there. Now something interesting, when you look at Asia, what do you see there? So almost along the Arctic Circle, right? In the northern part. So, well, what we want to go where trees are located to do a tree ring record. But there's other things that come into consideration when we're trying to do a tree ring chronology. And that is what are we recording? So trees in different locations record different things. So if we're looking for temperature, we want to go to locations where trees have a limiting factor of temperature. So if you go down to Louisiana where it's nice and warm, those trees grow happy all the time. Temperature is not really a limiting factor. So if we go to the Rocky Mountains and go up to the tree line, their temperature is a limiting factor. So in those locations, we're going to have very temperature sensitive trees. Okay. If we go to locations in the American Southwest where lots of droughts occur, their limiting factor is going to be drought and water supply. So those particular trees are going to record what's happening with precipitation. So it can be the same species of tree, one lower on the mountain, one higher on the mountain, recording two different things. So location is very important. Okay. So that's just kind of a, an overview of what we do with tree rings. I want to get back to CO2. How do we know what CO2 is doing over the past thousand years? So this information we get from ice cores. And this particular picture, this is a famous picture of the Calcaya um, Glacier down in Peru. Now you'll notice something here. What is happening on the face of this glacier? Kind of like a big old wedding cake. It's got layers in it. So what happens in this location is in the wintertime it snows, so it builds up ice, and in the summertime it's really windy and sunny. So there's a dust layer. So now we have an annual chronology in our glacier. So if we know when we poured at the top, we can count the years going back in time to establish our chronology. So by looking at what's included in that ice, it can tell us something about what's happening with climate. Now, for CO2, this is what's really interesting with the ice core, and that is when the snow falls, so at the diagram at the very top, you have the nice fluffy snow. So as more snow falls, the snow below it becomes compact. So as it continues to be compact, as you move down, all these little pockets of air become sealed. Eventually, they're completely sealed off from the atmosphere. So now what you have in your ice record are time capsules of the past atmosphere. So we can go in, measure CO2 in this time capsule, and it'll tell us how much CO2 is in the atmosphere going back a thousand years. So now you guys know how we got that graph. So we can look at little time capsules from the ice core. So then here's an example to show you what these ice cores look like. So this is from the Greenland Ice Sheet Project. You, you see the layering inside the cores with little ice bubbles that tell us something about the environment, or about the atmosphere. Now other things we can measure in ice cores include the chemistry. So we have 
the air bubbles, so that tells us about CO2, tells us about methane. We can look at the chemistry of the water, and that's tied to what temperature is. So we do something called oxygen isotope analysis. So we're looking at different isotopes of water or oxygen that are contained in the water. So that proxy tells us about temperature change. So this is a, for paleo folks, this is a famous graph. This is the Vostok ice core record. So Vostok is down in Antarctica. So have, me, have you guys heard of Lake Vostok maybe? Okay, so same location. So what this record is showing us for the top panel, that's carbon dioxide. So those are the little time capsules that shows us how much CO2 was in the atmosphere going back 400,000 years. So we know what CO2 was like in the atmosphere. So by looking at our oxygen isotope proxies, we can get temperature out, we can look at methane, so another atmospheric gas, and all of this tells us what's been going on with the climate system over the past 400,000 years. So anybody know what this, all these wiggles on this graph mean? There are lots of them. Any guess? Besides the Warm and cold Yeah, it's warm and cold periods. We're looking at the ice ages here. So this is where the Earth itself was going through periods of very cold temperatures where ice sheets were built up over North America, over Europe, and over Asia. This was enough to drop sea level 120 meters. So we're talking about a lot of ice being taken out of the ocean, put onto land. So big climate changes. Okay? So in this particular ice core record, we see four of these ice cycles, or these ice age cycles. So 400,000 years ago, we were in an interglacial, down into the cold period, then rapid warming, gradual cooling, rapid warming, gradual cooling, rapid warming, down to the cold period, and then at the far left-hand side is our present interglacial. And again, for paleoclimatologists looking at this data, you'll notice the previous interglacials have more CO2, higher temperatures than where we're at today. So from a paleoclimate perspective, naturally, we can get a lot warmer. Now I'm going to throw on top of that what we're doing with fossil fuel burning. So it's just um, Wally Broker, he has a book called uh, oh, the, the Angry Beast. So the Earth is this angry beast and we're poking it with a stick. Okay. So that's the Vostok Ice Core record. So that's how we know we've had ice ages in the past. So you say we're higher in the past than the CO2 in the present? Yes. I mean, this, this shows like 200 and sort of 90 right. or something. That's, that's like way pre below. Pre 20th we're, century. Right. So that's like way below what we're at right now, right? Right. So what's CO2 levels right now? 400. Yeah. So, so right. that's 280. Okay. So we are way higher right now. Than right. We but see, before natural variability, yes, CO2 is higher. We're now way above that. Okay. Oh, but natural, natural variability. Right. Right. Sorry. Thank you for okay. having me clarify. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So let's go back a little further in time. So now we can, so ice core records only get us back so far because we have to have the depth of the glacier to get that information. So how can we push back further in time? So this is when we get into marine sediment records. So um, oceanographers go out on ships. Anybody recognize that type of ship there at the bottom? Yeah, that's a joint, but it's basically an oil prospecting ship. Okay, and we use it to do science. So the difference is, is we keep the cores instead of blowing it out. Okay. So if you take one of these sediment cores and look at it, you'll see going back through time. So the top's over here at the top left. Going back through time, you'll see these shifts in color of the sediments. So there's some dark areas and there's white areas. So that tells us something's changing in the ocean above where these sediments were collected. Okay. So one of the primary organisms that paleoclimatologists look at is a little planktonic foraminifera. So, and that's a picture of a live corium, 
So it's kind of this ball of plasm and this little shell that's in the middle. So the top left there, that's an SEM image of a global dry uh, rubber. So this particular plankton lives in the Gulf of Mexico. They're really easy to, to find in the sediments because they're pink. All the other ones are white. And by looking at the chemistry of that shell, I can go back and calculate what the temperature was when that shell was formed. So what was the water temperature that that organism lived in? So by taking that information, going down for measuring lots of these little shells going back in time, we can look at what has changed in the ocean over long time periods. So we looked at the ice core record, so that pushed us back 400,000 years. So now with marine sediments, we're going back 800,000 years. And again, we see this same cycle of warm periods and cold periods. So these are the ice ages. So we know from the ice core record back to here, we went through four ice ages. As we push back, we see even more ice ages. So these are periods where the Earth has gone from warm to cold, warm to cold. With even longer marine sediment cores, we can now push this back almost 500, or sorry, 5 million years. And if you compare that to ice cores, that's just a very tiny snippet of this whole record. So what we're looking at in this bottom diagram, again, it's these little tiny plankton. By measuring their chemistry, we see that we go back 5.5 million years ago, the Earth was quite warm. And then we went through this cooling period, and eventually into our ice ages. So this is giving us this natural archive of how temperatures have changed going back in time. Right. 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 So on these single records, the error bars on these are about a half a degree. So again, quite small. So with the IPCC report, we had lots of tree ring records for that thousand years. The error bars for tree rings are a lot bigger. So these particular records have nice small error bars. And it's been duplicated all over the ocean. So I'm just showing one record. Is this it's okay. um, maybe you you said that before. Maybe uh, you're gonna get to this, but how do you how do you know how old the record is? Right. You know what it tells you, but how how do you know how old it is? Right. Also with the um, ice core records. Right. So like the trapped air. Right. Well, that's an important question. So chronology is very important. So we have some records that have layers in them, so we can count the years. So like ice core tree rings, we can count the years going back in time. With these marine sediment core records, we can use different types of radiometric dating. So we can use radiocarbon, and that'll get us back 50,000 years. As we push back further in time, we have to use other radiometric dating methods. So, but yeah, dating is another important concern. Other questions? John? It seems that when you look at the left hand part of that figure, mm -hmm. the variability is increased to somewhere mm -hmm. along the point there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is um, greenhouse world. So nice and warm, not a lot of variability. We get into the ice house world, very variable. Okay. So let me back up one. Okay. So we're looking here at temperature changes, but you'll notice here on this right axis, I also have sea level on here. It's one of the things that's happening with changes in temperature is sea levels also changing. And they two are working together. So as temperatures drop, water's being removed from the ocean, being put on land. That's causing sea level change. So this gets us to sea level rise. So this is just in a little schematic of one of these ice sheets on land. So physically taking water out of the ocean, putting it onto land will drop sea level. So our sea level cycles, we're looking at 125 meters to 130, 35 meters. This is a big change when you think about it. Okay? So the bottom graph here, this just shows coming out of the last interglacial. So, um, I'm sorry, last glacial period. 
So 20,000 years ago, so the ice sheet started to melt. So all of that water started moving back to the ocean. And you'll see that sea level rise starts to stabilize about 3,000 years ago. So we're talking about massive amount of change in sea level over about 10,000, 12,000 years. Okay? So this is going to have a real impact on what's happening with different ecosystems that occur on the coastlines. If we look at what's happening with current sea level rise, so again, what we've been seeing here in the 20th century and 21st century is about 1.7 millimeters per year. That's accelerated up to about 3.2 millimeters per year. And with 20th century projections, so we're looking at 0.3 to 0.8 meters of sea level rise in the next century. And most of that's due to melting of the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. Now, some of you guys may have, if you watch the nature and science uh, reports that come out every couple or every week, there's been a lot of papers come out the past month about the estimates of melting in the western um, Antarctic ice sheet. And what they're talking about is this area right in here. So you'll notice most of this ice shelf is over water. What's happened is the ice melted back enough where the ledge that's underwater is no longer holding back that ice sheet. So now they're fearing that this whole ice sheet is going to start to collapse. So that's what they're talking about in the news. Now, when you think about it, you know, it's like, wow, changing sea level that much. But if you look at the cross sections at the bottom here for Greenland and Antarctica, you can see that these ice sheets are quite thick. So two kilometers to three kilometers. We're talking about a lot of ice melting going back into the ocean. And this is what's going to cause sea level to rise. Now, going back into the past, how do we know sea level has changed in the past? So we can use other proxies to tell us about that. So one of the proxies we can use are corals. So this particular coral, it's a micro atoll. So you'll notice the top of it looks really dead. That's because it was dead. And this coral actually grew up to the surface of the water. So it, as it continues to grow, it has no place to go because it won't grow out of the water. So that dies and it continues to grow on the side. So by looking at micro atolls and other corals that lived right at the sea surface, we can go back and reconstruct how sea level has changed in the past. So, how many of you guys have been down to the Florida Keys? All right, so Upper Florida Keys, that is a fossil coral reef from 120,000 years ago. So, now that's natural sea level change. So, the Keys today at one point were underwater for that coral reef to form. Okay. So, that's another way we know sea level has changed. So, I have a picture here, this is one of those fossil reefs. Um, there's a fossil reef state park um, right off of, when you're going down US-1, past Key Largo. It's a really neat place to go in and see. If you stop at any of the rest stops down in the Everglades, those buildings are made out of fossil coral. So, um, but by looking at these corals, we can go back and reconstruct what has happened with sea level in the past. Because corals are going to track the changes in sea level. So this is how we know sea level has changed. So those graphs I was showing you of sea level change, that's all from corals. So, so look at what's projected to happen with sea level rise. So um, this is a particular graphic that I found that shows New Orleans area with Lake Pontchartrain, so close to home for me. Um, so this is today. We give it five feet of sea level rise, which is what we're expecting in the next 100 to 300 years. So New Orleans is pretty much underwater. So the pieces that are still above water are the levees around the Mississippi River. So I-12 is that interstate just to the north. So the water's just south of there. So we'll give it 12 feet of sea level rise by 2300. So now most of those levees the Mississippi River are underwater and the water is now starting to move north of I-12. 25 feet of sea level rise. Pretty much all of coastal Louisiana is gone. So in Baton Rouge, we are also underwater. 
So when I purchased my house in Baton Rouge, I did one thing on purpose, and that was I wanted to be on top of the Pleistocene Ridge. My realtor had no idea what I was talking about. So I broke out the geologic map, and he said, this is where I want to be. She's like, why? I said, well, after sea level rise, I'll have beachfront property. <laughs> so, but this is this is what's happening on the coastline now. With Louisiana, we have lots of other things besides sea level. I mean, sea level rise for the whole Earth going up, plus thermal expansion of seawater. We've got subsidence because of the levees, um, the Mississippi River, the things that the Corps of Engineers have done. So, we're losing our coast pretty quick. Um, if we were to think about the whole of the U.S. and we melt all, we melt all of the ice in Antarctica and in Greenland, what or what our coastlines look like. So this is a figure in National Geographic, I think nicely shows that. Um, so my little piece of coastal property would be right about there. So, but you know, so looking at this, I mean, state of Florida, underwater, so most of Georgia, all of our coastal, our east coast of the U.S., is underwater so um, you know even looking at Imperial Valley over in California that's in the water too so these are the kinds of things to think about you know the two extremes so that's kind of what paleoclimatologists do is we look at the extremes what can happen what has happened in the past what can happen in the future okay so I'm going to continue on with corals because that's my my archive that I specialize in so besides telling us about sea level, corals can also tell us something about what's been happening in the ocean as far as temperature going back into the past. So I think Gil showed this a nice explanation of what we do. Um, so we go out with scuba, poke a hole in one of these large colonies. Um, the cores come out, look kind of like this. So these are actually out of dry tortugas. We take those slabs and x-ray them. They have annual bands in them just like a tree so we can establish our chronologies. We look at the chemistry and we can produce a reconstruction. So this is the uh, sea surface temperature reconstruction for the dry tortugas going back 100, or sorry, 234 years. Now what's interesting, looking at this record, so 20th century over here to the right, you can see the warmer period. So we've gone through the 20th century this warming interval, we get into the little ice age, we see cooler periods. But notice, there's also periods that need to be quite warm. And I've got my arrow bars up here. That's the gray area. But we also see that there's cold periods and warm periods. So little ice age is not this everything was colder period. It was a time when things did get warm and they did get colder. Um, interesting with this record, the Dalton sunspot minimum, so that's one of the things people have tied to causing this colder interval, this particular record, I do not have my coldest interval here in the Dalton. It's just so something else is happening in the Dalton. And most of what's happening in Dry Tortugas is tied to the Gulf Stream and what's happening with the loop current, so how ocean water is being transported through the ocean. And I can talk about this forever, but I will move on. Um, so why do we care about sea surface temperature? And that's because sea surface temperature tells us something about moisture flux out of the ocean. So where do we get precipitation from? It comes from the ocean. So if we look at the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, this is where all the moisture is coming from that's flowing into Central America and into the United States. That's our moisture source. So if we look at temperature in the ocean, that tells us something about moisture flux, and then down the stream to precipitation. So that's where we care about sea surface temperature. Now, another reason we look at sea surface temperature is because of these guys, hurricanes. Warmer ocean temperatures means there's more fuel for hurricanes. We have stronger hurricanes. So if we look at, this this is a graph from NOAA that shows us where all the landfalling hurricanes have struck the U.S., um, and you can see here in the Gulf of Mexico, Florida, lots of hurricanes come in. So that's something that we're interested in looking at, is how temperatures and hurricanes have linked going back into the past. So again, talking about sea level rise, now we put hurricanes on top of it with storm surge. So on the coast, we can get some huge storm surge. 
So looking at Hurricane Katrina, so 27 feet of storm surge, and that was a past Christian. So go back to Camille back in 69. Again, almost 25 feet of sea level of surge occurred in those two locations. So in almost the same place. So these are very vulnerable locations when it comes to storms. So the Galveston storm comes in right below that. So all of this ties back in to understanding what's going on with climate and the past. So I will wrap it there. How am I doing on time? About five? Okay. So questions? And if nobody has a question, I have a cool video to show you if you want to see that. Okay. So again, this is something... Um, this is a dive trip I did last year. So um, what you're looking at here, these are cypress stumps. Sorry for the bubbles. But that is the stump of a bald cypress tree underwater. So now that I told you what it is, you can see it. So, so the stump is buried in the sediment. The top of it has eroded, but the sediments underneath are anoxic. So it preserves the wood. So these are ice age trees underwater. So this is 10 miles off the coast of Alabama in 60 foot of water. So, and this is a relatively tectonically stable location. So this is to me physical evidence of sea level rise and how how the coastline can change quite a bit. So so yes, yeah, so this this particular video is from last October. So we've been going out collecting wood. Um, I'm working with a dendrochronologist at Southern Miss. So we've already created 300 year long uh, tree ring reconstruction from the site. So we're waiting for radiocarbon dates to come in. We're going out doing sediment cores. But, but it's one of those things, it's amazing to sit 10 miles off the coast. You can barely see the beach and the condos on Orange Beach. And below us, is this cypress forest. So, so I think that's one of those things, I like to show it because it really drives home what climate change and coastal impacts can be. So. All right, so questions? I wasn't sure if I was gonna have time to show that. Uh, I have questions. Yes. Right. No, it's a good question. So how do we tease apart? It's I think understand the past, what is natural climate variability is an important question. Um, we have to know what those ranges are. So for the ice ages, we know how what CO2 levels can be, and we know how high sea level can be with those changes, and we know the other extreme. So we have those two end members to work with. So, and what drives those two? So we're looking at CO2 changes driving the, the, the ice ages. So now we've got this increase in CO2 to 400 ppm. So what, how do we blend those two together? I think that's where climate models come in, where we can go in and do these experiments to show that we'll have to talk this afternoon or this afternoon on that, um, where we can go in and do these experiments to try to tease apart the natural versus anthropogenic portion. Yes. Right. Uplift in the Gulf Coast is quite small because it's, I mean, most of the eastern part of the U.S. is tectonically stable. That's why we have the nice big continental shelf. Um, in Louisiana, we have subsidence issues. And that's due to subsidence, and the delta is no longer naturally growing. So we have subsidence. So, so yes, yeah, so it, it does play it. Also, with the ice sheets, when you take you know those big ice sheets off of land, it, the the land's been compressed. So in some places in Canada and Europe, it's actually coming up quite quick. So, so it does change. Other questions? One quick one or good? Okay. Right. Stop. Okay.